So welcome everybody to today's webinar called Concerned About an Older Driver, We Can Help. So we really appreciate you coming along and listening to this webinar today. My name is Rob Hurd. I'm the chair and founder of the Older Drivers Forum. Now, I was in the police for 30 years, 26 of them roads policing, traffic officer, riding motorcycles and cars, bit of a petrol head, still am, love everything there is to do with cars and motorcycles. But I'm also very passionate about road safety. And that's why I set up the Older Drivers Forum whilst in the police, and I've carried on running it now as well. Now, that's one of the things I'm really keen to try and help and support mature motorists to carry on driving safely for longer, but also give advice to family and friends about what advice they can give and support their loved ones in their lives as well. So that's why today's webinar is so important for us, because we really want to make sure that none of us become complacent about our abilities and also get that help and love and support from family members or friends who can really help us through that. So to help us with that today, we've got three speakers, really useful. So the first speaker we've got today is Nigel Lloyd-Jones. He's um, the co-lead for the Gloucestershire part of the Older Drivers Forum. We've also got Alexandra Lloyd-Jones. She's the other co-lead of Gloucestershire um, Older Drivers Forum. And we've also got Rachel O'Dell. Now, Rachel O'Dell is a member of Driving Mobility and runs the Hubs Mobility Service down in Southampton. But she's going to give us a really good overview of what they do and can and help and support you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand you over to Nigel and Alexandra first to kick us off, off with this first part of the presentation. And like I said, if you've got any Q&A questions that you want to share with us, just type them in the Q&A button. So over to you, Nigel. Rob, thank you very much indeed, and, and welcome everybody on this chilly, uh, chilly afternoon. So driving is a very emotive subject. Um, the Swedish uh, songwriter Liki Lee captured the essence of what driving means to me when she said, driving for me means the power of freedom, the feeling I can go anywhere at any time is exhilarating. Now, we all have emotional reasons why driving is such an important aspect of our lives, but with that comes great responsibility to keep ourselves and others safe. Now, this afternoon, whilst you'll hear a lot of passion in our presentation, uh, everything you hear is evidence informed. Now, this comes from national and local statutory partners, Department for Transport Older Driver Task Force reports, and international and national road safety organizations. And we also draw on the work of subject matter expert, Professor Charles Musselwhite. But don't worry, we're not going to blind you with data. Now, I'd also like to acknowledge and thank all the image sources that we use in our presentation. So, what triggered you to devote your precious weekend time to be here this afternoon? Have you been concerned about a loved one, a friend, or someone you're caring for becoming more anxious about driving? Have you seen more scrapes on their car? Are you becoming uncomfortable with them being your children's taxi service? Have you had some scary moments with your partner at the wheel? Now, each of you will have your own unique situation, and each of you will have different levels of road safety knowledge, and each of you will have your own strategies on how to discuss emotive subjects. Mature driving is a vast and complex subject, but what we hope you'll gain this afternoon is a clear structure, process, and lots of useful tips in taking another step forward wherever you are on your journey. Good afternoon for me. Our agenda is, first we look at the big picture around mature driver safety. Next, we explore how to start meaningful conversations with the person that you may be concerned about and share advice on how to keep them driving safely for longer. We then look at how to plan for when it is time to retire from driving. So first, the big picture. Nationally, there are 5.8 million license holders in the 70 and over age group and they are increasing by a quarter of a million a year. So there are thousands of families and friends and colleagues facing similar concerns to your own. However, our elderly generation are a vital sector of the population to keep mobile. 
They're working longer as the age of retirement is extended. And with the cost of living crisis, there is now a record 1.5 million pensioners back to work. They are a powerhouse of the voluntary sector. Age UK estimate that grandparenting childcare is worth a staggering 2.2 billion to the economy. Driving is also important to maintain independence and combating loneliness. Now, whilst mature drivers have a wealth of experience and tolerance, sight, hearing, reaction time, judgment of speed and distance may not be as good as it once was. So therefore self-regulate and are comparatively safe. However, there are four times more likely to be killed and injured in a collision due to physical frailty and pre-existing medical conditions. Now the top five contributory factors where mature drivers are deemed at fault in a collision are as follows. Fail to look properly, fail to judge other person's path or speed, loss of control, illness or disability, mental or physical, and poor turn or manoeuvre. Now, these all reflect those failing cognitive mobility and health issues. And during our presentation, we will highlight traffic scenarios where these vulnerabilities are most exposed. The outcome of all of this is that elderly drivers are overrepresented in road casualties. They account for 15% of all license holders, just 11% of all miles driven, but 28% of all road fatalities. So let us now consider how to engage in meaningful conversations with the person that you're concerned about. And to aid this process, we break this down into three elements. Who, when, what? The who considers two groups. First, the driver and their personality and how that guides us on how to best to engage with them. The second who is who in the family or friendship group is best equipped to lead conversations. And the when looks at the timing of such conversations. The what is advice on how to keep them driving safely for longer and how to plan from retiring. Now for who and the driver's personality, we're gonna look at a model developed by Professor Musselwhite now, this identifies three key mature driver personality types. So let's consider the first, the long-term planners, and let's call him Peter. Now, Peter is an independent person with a strong intellect and enjoys a challenge. Most of his driving is local and support his practical needs, such as shopping and visiting the doctor. He was triggered to think about his fitness to drive following his retirement for work, for, from work and this set him on a path of long-term planning. Now for Peter, what is most helpful is gathering information and for family and friends to metaphorically walk alongside him as he evolves his driving plan. The next is the short-term supported, Susan. Susan is a very social person with most of her high annual mileage relating to sustaining her busy way of life. Conversations about driving skills and planning for driving retirement are instigated through family and friends, people she trusts. Susan welcomes practical and emotional support every step of the way. Now, the last group are the most challenging and which Muscle White calls reactive, Roger. Now, Roger is complacent about his declining uh, cognitive and mobility skills, which are impacting his ability to drive. And he stubbornly continues his way of life and reacts angrily to any advice. Now, he has little awareness of how he would carry on his life without a car. Now, with this type of personality, they are often resistant to family comments, but accept advice from professionals or are ultimately forced to change by family or police intervention. Now, whilst this model is a generalization, we hope it's helpful in considering your own situation. Now, the next part of who concerns the most appropriate member of the family or friendship group to lead conversations. So consider the personalities involved and previous experience in discussing challenging topics. Now, some families mistakenly assign this to the most authoritative person, 
to deliver their concerns as an ultimatum, when a more compassionate, non-judgmental approach is required. Hearing sensitive information from the right person will make a big difference. Now, not surprisingly, research confirms that conversations are often best initiated by a spouse, adult child, or a trusted friend, with the rest of the family putting on a united front to help the driver make safe decisions. The when concerns the right time to talk. Ideally, these discussions should start before driving becomes a problem. So it's important to normalise the topic of road safety as part of day-to-day -day conversations. Ways to achieve this is to talk about road safety issues relating to the family, such as the grandchildren's latest car seat, or issues around the school run, or mentioning the latest police awareness campaign, and even drawing attention to news about a recent road collision. This is not to scare the driver, but to keep them informed. Also chat about family history around other relatives reduced or eventually retired from driving. All of this gives opportunities for conversations about attitudes and responsibilities around safe driving. These conversations can be introduced at key moments in time concerning changes in the driver's health and driving abilities. However, if they are already causing concern, be prepared that the initial conversations may invoke strong emotions. And you will need to be to persevere to ensure helpful discussions and diffuse the negative feelings. We urge you not to postpone these conversations because of fear or guilt that you didn't start sooner. It is vitally important not to avoid difficult conversations, to avoid potential tragedies. So now on to the what and how can we help drivers such as Peter, Susan and even Roger to drive safely for longer. Now there are three main elements to any driving scenario which we can influence. Driving ability, preparedness and suitability of their vehicle and journey planning. So let's first consider driving ability. Now, our headline alert here is there is no exact science on defining at what age we become a mature driver, as a decline in our cognitive abilities and mobility impacting fitness to drive can be quite subtle and varies from person to person. Driver illness or disability is the fourth most significant contributory factor in mature driver at fault in collisions. And that's why regular health checks to confirm fitness to drive are so important. Now at 70, we're required by the DVLA to renew our license and declare we've had an eye test and there are no medical reasons that might affect our ability to drive. Now the licensure renewal is not intended to victimize us, but acknowledges that by this age, many of us have health issues that affect driving. Now the importance of eye tests is because 90% of all information used to drive is visual. However, eyesight deteriorates gradually without us necessarily becoming aware. And we may compensate for this without realizing our sight may have fallen below the legal limit. Now at the eye test, we recommend asking the optician if they have the equipment to check peripheral vision and request they perform that test for which there will be an additional charge. Now peripheral vision is crucial for safe driving. By our 70s, we can lose 20 to 30 degrees of our peripheral vision, which is why with age, we become more vulnerable to collisions when merging with fast traffic. Now, this is evident by failure to look properly being the major contributory factor in mature drivers at fault in collisions. Now, at a test, the optician will give an alert if they spot any condition that might affect our ability to drive. So this is someone with normal vision. And now someone with cataracts, someone with normal vision, and now someone with advanced macular degeneration. Now failing eyesight is one of the main reasons for driving retirement, which is why eye tests are so important. Now, if you'd like to know more about eyesight and driving, then register on our website for our next, for our webinar next Tuesday at two o'clock posted 
by Valerie Singleton. So back to our mature driver. When they have an eye test, suggest they also take the opportunity to have a hearing test, which many opticians are now offering. But there are other areas we need to look at to assess true ability to drive. How is their mobility? Is the full movement of neck and hands? Do they have issues with their feet? And do they walk comfortably? A good safety procedure which checks flexibility is one of the recommendations in the highway code and it's to use the Dutch reach to get out of the car. Now this involves using the opposite hand to pull open the door which results in the body naturally swiveling around so they might see more easily a cyclist that might be riding by. How quick are their reactions? By 65 reactions can be 22 times slower than a 30 year old. Check with the GP on whether there are any medical conditions that should be reported to the DVLA and insurance company. Currently, there are 286 conditions that need to be checked, although confusingly, only 15 are actually mentioned on the license renewal form. Here we want to highlight two conditions, dementia and diabetes and emphasize how important it is to get specialist advice with qualified professionals about these conditions and their impact on fitness to drive. On our website are webinars that discuss these conditions in detail. Information packs are also available from the Alzheimer's Society and Diabetes UK. So what about medications? Check with the GP or pharmacist on whether any of these will impact the ability to drive. Carefully che checks are also needed if there, is, if there is a change in dosage. A new prescription is given with the risk of negative interaction with an existing medication. Also be alert if your relative or client is using a friend's prescribed medication. It's sobering to reflect that failure to declare medical conditions can result in a thousand pound fine and prosecution in the event of a collision, but it would also invalidate the driver's insurance. Now, if driving is causing anxiety, we recommend drivers take a confidence building, mature driver assessment offer, offered by organizations such as IMA RoadSmart. Now these assessments take one hour, use our own car and take place on roads familiar to us. And they cost around 65 pounds. You can even bring a friend. Now, these assessments are confidential and purely supportive. There's no need to inform the DVLA or insurers of the outcome. Now, if there are any cognitive or mobility issues, then assessment should take place at a driving mobility center. Now here, I'd like to ask Rachel to join us. Uh, thank you very much for being with us uh, this afternoon, Rachel. Just to, uh, just to mention, Rachel is uh, the Hubs Mobility Officer of Wessex Drivability. She has got years and years of experience uh, with older drivers. So, so um, Rachel, first of all, could you just tell us a little bit about driving mobility, the organization? Yes, certainly. Thanks, Nigel. Um, so Driving Mobility is a national registered charity and it's uh, formulated by 20 independent centres across the country. So that's Northern Ireland, Scotland, England and Wales. And uh, we're there really to provide driving assessments for people who have a medical condition. So it might be somebody who's uh, elderly and developing dementia. They may have had a stroke, Parkinson's, that type of thing. So we're ideally assessing their fitness to drive to see if they're OK to still be on the road. But it may also be that we're looking at adaptations to help them on their, their, their way as well. But the important thing to know is we are the only agency that is actually accredited by the DVLA to carry out these type of fitness to drive assessments. Great. So tell us about the assessments. What, what's actually involved? 
Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing that we would do on an assessment, the, the driver doesn't go straight out in a car, we will do what we call a pre-drive assessment. And that's uh, about 40 minutes with the, the client, the driver, sitting in a room with an occupational therapist. So we do have that clinical input onto our assessments, because remember, we are looking at medical conditions or potentially physical disabilities. So there's a sort of chat with the driver about their driving history, the type of driving that they do, you know, what they've done in the past, what they do now, uh, how they use their car, that type of thing. And they will also undergo some cognitive testing. That forms a very important part of the driving assessment as well to understand what's going on with somebody. You know, their brain forms a large part of their driving. So that's, that's quite important. Once we've done the pre-drive, we then progress onto the driving part of the assessment and it's important to know that the driving takes place in one of our centre vehicles um, because we have dual controls in those so that we can keep the car safe no matter what happens out on the road. We have a driving instructor who will sit in the passenger seat. Uh, they won't use the dual controls if they don't have to. Obviously, we let the driver you know, do their thing, um, but there may be times where we do need to intervene in order to maintain safety in the car so we do have those dual controls so we will actually allow the driver to get used to that car we we understand it's not their familiar vehicle but that's where the, the assessment will take place and then they'll go out on a, a set driving route so we can give advice um, on how to make driving easier if somebody has a problem with a, a bit of mobility perhaps a sort of stiff neck we might be looking at to a panoramic mirror for them that type of thing and there are simple adaptations that can be fitted to most types of car. Great. So then what are the potential outcomes having, having gone through all that assessment? Yeah, OK. I mean, there are three potential outcomes. First off is the, the happy one. Somebody's safe. We don't need to fit any adaptations. We think they're fit to continue driving and we welcome them on their way. So the second outcome is the un unsafe outcome. Unfortunately, there are some drivers where it's clear that their medical condition is impacting on their driving so severely that they do need to stop immediately. And we do tell them today, unfortunately, that's your last drive. You need to stop immediately. And then they will receive a report which they do need to forward on to the DVLA. Or in fact, if they've been referred to us by the DVLA, we send the report straight across to the DVLA. They make the ultimate decision. End of the day, it's not us. It's our recommendation and the DVLA will be the ones who choose whether somebody continue, you know, continues to drive or not. So the third and final way, it might be that we see somebody um, who has got into some bad habits, some bad driving habits. It can happen. We all get a little bit complacent about our driving and um, we will look at that person and say, OK, we've seen some things that mean you're unsafe on the road today. However, we do feel that you have listened to the advice we've given in the car during the assessment. You've retained that. You've made a small improvement. It's not enough at the moment but what we would recommend is go and have some lessons brush up on those errors come back and see us within three months and then hopefully we will review them and see that the the tuition has made an improvement so at that point they're still unsafe it's an unsafe safe review but there is a potential for that person to continue driving gosh it sounds like there's an awful lot of work work, work involved what actually how much do these assessments cost then Yes, as you say, there is a big input from our staff and the assessment does take about two to two and a half hours and that's reflected in the cost. It does vary from centre to centre. We're all independent businesses across uh, the UK, so we all set our own charges. But on average, a cost would be about £150 for a privately referred client. Um, DVLA clients don't pay anything. The DVLA will subsidise that, that assessment. But there is also some, some centres run subsidised schemes for clients who are referred through their doctor or their health professionals so there are some subsidies available out there through some centers great great rachel thank you very much indeed and we'll be hearing from rachel uh, a little later on about another thing now one of the things that's required for these assessments is uh, up-to-date knowledge of the highway code and, and many of you will have undoubtedly heard of that there were major revisions uh, last year now we'd just like to run another little poll here to actually just understand with you uh, your kind of knowledge, your experience of the Highway Code. So here we are. The question is, when did you last look at the Highway Code? Within the last year, in the last three years, in the last five years, or not since I passed my test? So if you'd like to vote now, that would be fantastic. And we're just allowing a little time for you to all vote. That's looking great. 
I should be fascinated to see the outcome of this. And here we've got the result has come up. So uh, within the last year, 41% of you have looked at it within the last year, 13% uh, in the last three years, 18% in the last five years, and 28% not since I passed my driving test. So it's very, very interesting. There have been very significant changes in, in the highway code. So we really urge you to, to go buy a copy. You can also view, view it free of charge on the DFT website. And please be aware, not knowing the rules of the highway code is no excuse in the eyes of the police. Alexandra. Now, during our lives, we ha all have refresher course for other qualifications that we may have. But driving, we can continue to drive based on a test that we might have passed when we were 17. We give our cars an MOT every year to ensure they are safe to drive. Surely it is logical that we do the same for ourselves. If fit to do so, drivers should keep driving regularly, so driving senses are kept sharp. If a couple, then share the driving so that both maintain the driving skills. If there is a hidden disability, they should wear a sunflower scheme lanyard and have a car sticker. This will alert the emergency services that they may need a little extra support. So our driving ability checklist is regular eyesight and hearing tests, an exercise regime to maintain mobility and to keep reactions up to speed. A check with the GP that there are no medical conditions that need to be reported to the DVLA and insurance company or any medications that affect the ability to drive. To refresh your knowledge of the highway code, to keep driving regularly, to keep sharp, sharing the driving if you're a couple an annual driver MOT with a mature driver assessment. Our final advice on driving ability is to ensure that the driver's health professionals are aware if their patient is still driving. Our experience is that this can sometimes be overlooked if a relative accompanies the driver to an appointment when the GP may then assume the relative is providing a taxi service. Okay, so what about the preparedness of the vehicle they drive? Now, our headline alert here is that many mature drivers' vehicles are only driven a few thousand miles a year. So extra care needs to be taken to ensure the vehicle's preparedness to drive if it's uh, not driven regularly. Now, this could be uh, even more of an issue if the driver doesn't feel up to doing those checks and is not aware of the latest thinking equipment and services are, are, are available. So checks you can help with are as follows. First of all, get a garage to check the car's battery health. Particularly in the winter, driving places higher demands on the battery with extra use of lights, heaters, and wipers. If the car is only driven short distances, then we need to ensure it is in good condition to hold its charge. Battery failure is the number one reason for call outs. Check all car lights are working and properly adjusted not forgetting the front and rear fog lights. Check tire pressures at least every two weeks so that the tires are in good condition with sufficient tread. Now by that, we do not mean the legal limit and the, why, and the reason why is this. Look at the stopping distance uh, dis differences in the wet at 50 miles an hour between a tire with three millimeters of tread and one at the legal limit, which takes 25% longer to stop. And that's why we recommend changing a tire when it reaches three millimeters of tread. Wiper blades work extra hard in the winter due to grit from the roads. So check the wipers clear the screen without smears. If wipers need replacing, then again, invest in a premium band such as Bosch Aero Twin, which are a witch Best Buy and constantly come out on top in comparative tests. When clearing the windscreen of ice, make sure to lift and clean the wiper blades to ensure they are not frozen to the screen. If we don't do this, then the wipers are operated, they will be damaged or the windscreen wiper motor will burn out. 
Check the windscreen fluid is topped up and with the correct rating for sub-zero temperatures. Now, SRAC recommend a premix effective down to minus 15 degrees Celsius. Now, most cars use a long life antifreeze, but a check should be made if the car's antifreeze needs changing. This is the tip I like. <laughs> Clean the door seals and apply a silicon spray lubricant to avoid the doors being frozen shut. Tell you it really works. Also, cover the windscreen with a frost guard or apply a pre ice uh, spray or to stop the ice forming in the first place. Check they have a can of de-icer and an ice scraper. Update them on the latest advice on how to de-ice and de-mist the car, including using the air conditioning, which acts like a dehumidifier, and dries the air in the car, speeding up demisting. It is vitally important that mature drivers, possibly with compromised eyesight, do not drive off before they have full visibility. Check the breakdown service documents are in the glove compartment and the telephone number stored on their phone. Also a warm blanket, mobile phone charger, torch, warning triangle, and a high visibility fluorescent bib. And keep a pair of dry shoes in the car for them to change into so wet feet don't slip on the pedals. If they have a smartphone, get them to download the What Three Words app. This identifies their location by three words. This can be given to the emergency services if they need help, help. And it is particularly helpful on rural roads with few landmarks. Also have a Lions Club message in a bottle with medical details inside the glove compartment. Now, these are available free from pharmacies and GPs. All of this might sound like an awful lot of kit, but if there is a breakdown or a driver or passenger is taken ill, the kit will be invaluable. Breakdown services report that the greatest number of breakdowns take place during the winter months. Drivers should also refresh their knowledge from the highway code on advice on what to do if they break down, which varies depending on the category of roads being driven. This is particularly important if they drive on smart motorways. Now, if help is needed with uh, vehicle checks, organisations such as Halfords offer a car check service. Now, it may sound tone deaf in these difficult economic times to talk about a changing car. However, we feel it would be remiss of us if we didn't draw attention to the rapid advances in car technology, particularly in the small car segment. So take a look here at a potential second-hand car, such as the award-winning Skoda Fabia. A 2018 model is equipped with features light years ahead of cars sold 10 years ago, many of which can compensate for age-related driving deficiencies. Uh, for greater reassurance in an emergency, all cars built since April 2018 are fitted with eCall. Now, if the driver needs help, they press the SOS button and can talk to the emergency service. If there's a serious incident, vehicle sensors automatically alert the emergency services, including the vehicle's location. For greater confidence on longer journeys, cars built from July 2022 are equipped with a fatigue detection system. Now, it detects drowsiness by the driver's eye or head movement, and it activates a coffee cup symbol to promote the driver to take a break. Pity if you want a cup of tea. What about oh, so We're also great fans of fitting dash cams. These are, give greater confidence in knowing antisocial behavior, um, uh, such as tailgating can be recorded. Um, this ev evidence can then be updated to most constabulary websites for consideration for a warning or prosecution. Now, our advice on tailgating is leave plenty of space to any vehicle ahead so that the impatient driver can overtake or when it is safe to do so, just pull over and let them pass. Now, if changing a car it is, uh, to car is planned, it is essential to allow plenty of time for test drives and familiarisation with the car's new features. 
Now, whilst new safety systems can be that extra pair of eyes on the road, the operation and benefits of the new technology need to be fully understood and are not a distraction. Extra care also needs to be taken if transitioning from manual to automatic. Learning to drive an automatic later in life can be challenging, as evidenced by the number of pedal confusion collisions. It seems that for some, it takes time to retrain the muscle memory. Now, if buying a second-hand car, dealers have told us that they are willing to explain vehicle features of the brand they represent. So our vehicle preparedness and suitability checklist is ensure the vehicle is fully prepared for winter driving. The car is sufficiently new to be equipped with the recent safety features and to ensure there's a comprehensive training on the new features. OK, next on to journey planning. Now, a headline alert here is that most fatal collisions take place within five miles of the driver's home with failure to judge other person's path or speed being a major contributory factor for mature drivers. Now, if they're planning to pop out for some shop for some shopping, urge them to remember to apply the same level of concentration as if they're setting off on a longer journey. So apply mindfulness every time they get in the car and never drive if tired or distracted. Now for local journeys, it's worth looking from time to time at the crash map service to identify road casualty spots. So this is information available at crashmap.co.uk. Now this map is the area around Bourton on the Water, which is a, a popular visitor destination here in Gloucestershire. Now, as you can see, this highlights the risk at the turn off from the Foss Way. And the high number of casualties in the town itself are primarily tourist pedestrians stepping off the pavement into the path of the car. So this is a very valuable source of information when you're planning. Alexandra. If they're planning a longer journey on unfamiliar roads, they should check online map services such as Google Maps and plan the route to minimize more demanding roads. Now, use motorways or dual carriageways as, as much as possible, as these are the safest classification of roads and likely to have been gritted. If they're not comfortable driving on motorways, then plan to use A roads. Many sat-navs offer the option to avoid motorways. If rural roads are required, watch out for this ice sign. These are often before overhanging trees or a bridge where a microclimate could cause the road to be first to freeze and last to thaw. They should also minimise routes with difficult junctions and the street view of online maps is invaluable in identifying these. Now, this is, I think, one of the most important bits of advice that you will hear on this webinar. The most frequent setting for mature driver collisions is turning right at T junctions. Now, these crashes are often due to reduced peripheral vision, a poor neck flexibility with a compromised ability to look quickly from left to right, a difficulty in judging uh, speed of oncoming uh, traffic, and then a slower cognitive ability to process all the inputs and when to make the decision to execute the turn. Now, once the decision is made to proceed, it's then vital to keep looking in case a fast approaching vehicle, such as a motorcycle, appears on the scene. Now, as I said, failure to judge other person's path and speed is the second highest contributory factor in mature driver at fault collisions. Now, if possible, they should avoid afternoon rush hours, which are statistically the most risky. They should also minimise driving into low sun or driving at night. So how long do you think it takes my 68 year old eyes to recover from headlamp or sunlight glare in comparison to a 15 year old? Now glare recovery on my eyes increases by seven seconds and just think how much further my car would have traveled during that time. Now, if like me, they wear glasses, make sure they have anti-reflective coating, which as you can see, helps reduce headband glare. 
make sure they have at least a quarter of a tank in case of unexpected delays. And in winter, allow an extra 15 minutes before a journey to ensure the windows and mirrors are de-iced and demisted. Now, our final advice on journey planning is to ask them always to let you know if they or a friend if they're going on a longer journey and not to rush and allow for rest stops and even an overnight stopover. It's better to arrive late than not at all. So our journey planning checklist is to research and drive on the safest routes and time of day, only to travel if they're feeling rested and well, and before setting off on a journey, check weather reports. If heavy rain, fog, floods, icy conditions, or even snow are fo forecast, then no journey is worth the risk. Right, time now to address the emotive subject of driving retirement and how to develop an alternative mobility plan to maintain independence. Now, most older drivers are highly responsible and want to do their bit to keep the roads safe. People like Peter and Susan. Peter will already have a long-term plan and will welcome further information. Susan will be supported by advice from family and friends, people she trusts. In their own time, they may find driving more stressful. Maybe they've had a few scary moments on the road. This starts to form a picture that it is time for a change. What we have learnt are the key elements to minimise stress are planning and timing. This is second nature to Peter, but Susan may need a little help. This planning could start years before when downsizing to ensure that there is good public service infrastructure where they are moving to. The next step is to develop a new mobility plan. So a starting point is to make a list of regular journeys and then research and trial how each journey could be made without driving a car. Now, this could include talking to neighbours about a local car sharing WhatsApp group with those who've retired from driving, contributing to fuel costs in return for an informal taxi service. Now, if they don't already do so, introduce them to online shopping. In terms of funding alternative transport, what is often underestimated is the overall cost of running a car, as the depreciation of the car's value is often overlooked. And it has been calculated that if a driver drives less than 2,000 miles a year, then it would be cheaper to take a taxi. So retiring from driving is likely to save money for many elderly drivers. OK, so here, there's Rachel on cue. <laughs> so we're asking Rachel to come back to talk about another service driving mobility uh, offer, the Hubs Mobility Advice Service. Now, now this is quite a, a new thing, isn't it, Rachel? That's right, Nigel. Um, it was launched in 2022, so we've been going, uh, coming up for a year actually now. Um, it is funded by the Department for Transport, and we have three years worth of funding for this pilot project, although we would hope very much that it will continue into the future. So the idea of the service is, is to provide free, impartial advice for anybody who is planning to retire from driving, or perhaps they're someone with a disability that's stopping them driving altogether. They may never have driven but they need some help and advice of how to get around so it's primarily as I say for people with medical conditions or disabilities that is impacting on their driving and uh, leading them to potentially stop. Great so um, I'm planning to retire from driving how do I actually engage with the service what what information do you need from me? Yeah, so, you know, we're happy to hear from anybody who's in this situation. The hubs are generally located within their local driving mobility centres. So you can find out where your driving mobility centre or your local hub is, either via, via the driving mobility website, or we have our own specialist hubs mobility advice website, and that will have the contact details of your nearest hub. You can get in contact by email, by telephone, or we also offer face-to-face -face consultations. That's generally by appointment, because obviously if we're dealing with with another client we can't just have a drop in but we will make an appointment for someone if perhaps they've got hearing difficulties and they can't use a telephone they're not capable of using email so we will talk to people face to face if necessary and we're really happy to use all of those those means so get in contact with us you might be referring on behalf of a friend or a relative 
But what we will then do is ask a lot of questions about the, the person who's stopping driving's travel needs. What do they want to do? What do they need to be able to do? And then we tailor our, our advice to each individual. They're all living in different parts of the country. One size doesn't fit all. Some people may be com you know, confident to use yeah. public transport, but they just don't really know what's there. So, you know, we're, we're really just finding out what those people want and bespoke advice for each person. Yeah. So um, could you just give us a, a little, have you got a case history of, of, of a service that you've offered? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this was a client, um, an elderly client, but they'd never driven, but they were hoping to learn to drive, but it was unsure how that would actually go with them. But they had very severe mobility issues, leading to them to being largely housebound. They couldn't get out without a car uh, and they had no local family living nearby, so very much socially isolated. They did have a small mobility scooter. So the first thing I did was to explore the option of getting on public transport if possible. That that's always what we would encourage people to do. Community transport may be limited and it's in high demand. So obviously we want to safeguard those places for the people who really need it. So I discussed the possibility of taking that scooter on a bus. That would involve liaising with the bus company. A bus company won't allow you with a scooter on the bus until you have undergone some training to make sure you'd be safe to do so. And the scooter would also need a permit to say it was of the right size to you know, enable it to travel on the bus. So, you know, I, I offered that as an option, a liaison to talk to the bus company and organize that training for the client. However, they decided that public transport, they were a bit frightened of taking public transport. Um, uh, there was an autoimmune issue with the person. So we discounted the public transport. And the next thing we looked at then was the dial -a ride service. Luckily, uh, there's a very good service in this client's area. It's a door-to-door -door service with a minibus, which is wheelchair accessible. So they would be able to you know, go from their own home to wherever they needed to go within the local area. And that was of a lot more interest to this client. However, it was unsure whether the scooter would be suitable to go on that minibus. So I then had a discussion about the local shop mobility service. So the client would be able to use the minibus to be dropped off in their local town centre at their shop mobility, where they could then hire a scooter for the day and be able to sort of be on their way, do their local shopping, etc. And there was another complication with this client in that their own scooter was actually on lease from a motability scheme. And as they were hoping to upgrade to a car, if they passed their test, they had been told that the moment they placed the order for their motability car, the scooter would be taken away from them. And the cars are on a bit of a, a back order at the moment, and it was potentially going to be six months before that client would receive their car. Uh, and in the meantime, they'd have no scooter. And that was obviously completely unacceptable. Yeah. The client themselves was finding it very frustrating trying to deal with motability. Yeah. However, you know, through our connections with driving mobility and motability, we work very closely together. I was able to intervene on behalf of that client and get that uh, that rule uh, yeah, overturned in this client's yeah. case so it was a very successful outcome wow oh, Rachel I mean it just sounds like a, a fantastic service but but you're not miracle workers are you no, sadly, the reality is that, you know, some areas, very rural areas, perhaps do lack um, community transport or these door to door dial -a ride services. In fact, um, Portsmouth, near where I live, don't have any community transport at all. So you could even be living in a town and be isolated because if you can't use a bus, then, you know, you've got no hope if you, you know, can't get on local transport. Yeah. So there are these real pockets. And of course, community transport is often funded or partially funded by each person's local authority and it depends what that local authority chooses to spend their money on of course everything is important and money doesn't go you know too far these days so it is a real postcode lottery but we try and help where we can yeah and I think as we're saying the vital thing is it? it's about planning 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 you know yeah. when we're in our you know when we're in our 60s we're downsizing we need to be thinking about these things now where are we going to live where are we going to be need near um, the services that you need yeah absolutely as you say driving um, is a very emotive subject and if people are told to stop immediately after an assessment perhaps it can come as a real shock to them they don't see it coming and they just don't know what they're going to do so it really is important for everybody to think families to come together in behalf of older drivers to make that retirement plan so it doesn't come as a shock so they can contact the hub find out what's available in that area. So have that, you know, numbers on the fridge of uh, dial-a-ride services. 
that. So have some idea of what's available in your area. Maybe take the bus once a week, you know, while you're still driving, just practice taking the bus, so you know what to expect. It's not a scary thing when you've tried it. Um, <laughs> just, you know, understand what's involved in the bus journey, practice where you need to get on and off. So really important to plan ahead, Great. definitely. Great. Rachel, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Mike. Okay. So um, we've had a lot of family experience around people retiring from driving. And one of our key learnings is you need to focus on the positives to counter the inevitable feelings of, of sadness at the change in their lives. In fact, by giving up driving, they might actually find they spend more time with family and friends and get out and about more often. They can develop a new friendship group with people that they travel with and their taxi or voluntary community driver might become their new best friend. Now, other positives are an improvement in fitness as alternative means of transport lead to more physical exercise. Now, ideally, there should be a gradual transition from driver to passenger, and that allows them and the family to adjust to the new situation. But unfortunately, not all mature drivers are so aware or receptive to family advice. People such as Roger. They lack of awareness, maybe because of undiagnosed dementia, or their dementia has moved to the next stage, which requires specialist support. With people such as Roger, there is no silver bullet. We need to recognise who they are and request professional intervention. For GPs, it's a challenging topic as they've no specific training on the issue. However, the DVLA has published a comprehensive advisory document and provided specialists that GPs can consult with. The DVLA emphasised it is vital that GPs receive evidence about long-term patterns of failing driving skills. Now, examples include an increasing number of scrapes on their car, curbing the wheels and parking inappropriately, or an increased anxiety when driving with a failure to respond appropriately to traffic situations, being easily distracted and relying on their partner as a co-pilot. So families should request a meeting with the GP and submit their evidence in writing, even with pictures. So the GP has a clear understanding of immediate concerns about their relative safety to drive. Now, one of the options the GP will then have is to refer the person to drive mobility for assessment, as we've heard before. As we have heard earlier, the outcome of that doesn't necessarily mean that the person will be told to stop driving, but they may require some retraining or refresh driving skills and iron out the bad habits that they may have formed over the years. Now, what we've learned from experiences with members of our family is that whilst they were reluctant to listen to family advice, after one-to-one -one consultations with their GP, in one case and with the other, their top interest, they were receptive to professional advice and took the decision to retire from driving. But be prepared, you may well have to persevere we also know from the death of our mother in a vehicle driven by an elderly relative that what you say or don't say can make the difference between safety or injury, life or death. Now, ultimately, if the professional's advice is not heeded, they have a public duty of care to uh, uh, break client confidence and report the matter to, do, to the DVLA. Family and friends can also notify the DVLA anonymously, and Crime Stoppers can also be used to make anonymous reports, which the police will follow up. Now, the GP's report to the DVLA would start a medical inquiry process, as they will only revoke a license if there is a medical reason, and not just because a person is a bad driver. But this inquiry could take months, and the older driver could continue to drive when they're not safe to do so. In that case, and as a last resort, the family may need to take away the keys and remove the car. Now, on our website, there is a flow chart which sets out the options that can be followed concerning intervention by a GP. So our driving retirement checklist is start planning as early as possible. 
make a list of regular journeys and develop an alternative plan. Manual, manage a gradual transition. Focus on the positives. As a last result, seek professional intervention. With personalities such as Rogers, you, if they do not follow professional advice, be prepared to take away the keys. So let's now consider your next steps. First, the who. Have you, have you had further insights on the personality of the driver you are concerned about and how best to approach them? Maybe you might be reconsidering who is the most appropriate person to lead the conversations. So take time to reflect on that. Next, the when. If you haven't already done so, do your research and then start the conversations as soon as possible and keep talking. From what you've heard, you may have more thoughts on how to introduce the topic. The sooner family conversations are normalized about road safety, the sooner progress can be made. Finally, the what. Use the information you've heard today to help them drive safely for longer and then to plan to retire from driving. And finally, we would ask your support in creating awareness in your community. Please share your experience with family and friends and colleagues and suggest registering for our other future webinars. Direct them to our and Drive Mobility's website, which is full of useful information. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and share our posts. Now, if you live in Gloucestershire, please email us and requesting us to be to, to add you to our database to be kept informed on local activities. So thank you all so much for attending this webinar uh, and, the, and doing your bit to make our roads safer. Now we're often asked, is there one key piece of advice that we would give? And this is eloquently expressed by comedian Bill Bailey, who said, when you lose people, you realize it's too short to avoid difficult conversations. Now with sensitivity towards the feelings of older drivers and with meaningful conversations, families can help their loved ones make safe decisions about their driving and ensure peace of mind for the entire family. We hope what you've heard today has been helpful. Thank you. Well, thank you ever so much, Nigel, Alexandra and Rachel. I'm sure you'll all totally agree with me that that's been an extremely very useful and informative presentation where they've really given us a huge amount of input that we can work and rely on. Now, there's been a lot of input to take part of. If you want to listen to this again, then visit our website, go to the events tab, and then you'll see webinars. And under there, you'll be able to see this in about 24 hours time, you'll be able to view it again and be able to take some notes. Also, at the end of this uh, webinar, you will be directed to our family and friends page on our website. We will be uploading this webinar to that as well and in the future we're going to be adding some of that really useful information that Nigel Alexander and Rachel have created for us so um it's kind of going to be a bit of time now that we're going to ask answer your questions that you've put through to us so um what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make sure that Alexandra Nigel and everybody are all there there you are and I've got a few questions to start with so first question my dad who is 75 in May falls into that Roger reactive category. I feel I've exhausted all the avenues of the family discussion as he is adamant he is not going to stop driving. I've spoken to the GP and I've asked him to help, but he will not refer him. What do I do? Any ideas what we can do on that, Nigel Alexander or even Rachel? Uh, Ra Rachel, I think you have probably faced this um, with some of your assessments, haven't you? What, what, what's your experience? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first and foremost, um, if uh, Roger, in this case, has a medical condition, then he certainly should be ideally coming along 
impact or driving mobility assessment center rather than the sort of lighter touch but i mean really we would encourage him to try and have a driving assessment if you are able to get him along to an assessment center if he feels his driving's fine um you know perhaps he wouldn't be fearful of coming for an assessment obviously we will be the judge of that on the day he, he may be fine um but you know we would like to see him if at all possible um if that has been already initiated with him and he's adamant he won't come for an assessment i mean we can only obviously do things with the client's consent we can't get the family to bring someone down and sort of put them on the doorstep and say assessment but i think uh, try and get in contact if you're really worried you can contact the dvla and ask them to make a referral so you can contact the dvla anonymously if you've got serious concerns about somebody's driving and the dvla are likely to launch an investigation you may even you know, rob you might have a feeling on this you may May even perhaps speak to your local police force i'm not sure if the police would uh, you know have any jurisdiction on this one but i would say you know encourage them voluntarily to come self-referral for a driving assessment preferably if there's a medical condition with the driving mobility assessment site it failing that dvla and ask them to investigate the dvla will contact the person's gp so the gp will be involved and the gp will be asked to have an input on that but they won't have to actually refer them if the GP won't do that, but they certainly will give advice to the DVLA about whether that person's medical condition might impact on them. And as I say, Robert, yeah, I don't know if there's anything the police might yeah. be able to do. Yeah, so from my experience back in the police force, like I said, I was 30 years as a police officer, 26 and road splitting. Um, now, I really did identify and come across drivers like this who were very adamant about their abilities. I've driven for 30, 40, 50 years, done millions of miles. I'm a perfectly capable driver. You know, there's nothing wrong with me. Very complacent. And now that's always a big difficulty that as we find as we age, we do very much easily become very complacent about our abilities. And therefore, it's sometimes very difficult for us to get advice from others, sometimes children, because, you know, we've been bringing up children. It's very difficult to get that input from it. Now, what really highlighted me and the reason why I set up the Older Drivers Forum was because back in 2011, unfortunately, I dealt with a fatality back at, um, in Basingstoke, involved an 89-year-old gentleman, retired GP, who ended up driving the wrong way down a dual carriageway for over a mile. Now, we found that he was blind in one eye, below the legal eyesight limit in the other, a retired GP, and thought he was genuinely fit to drive. Unfortunately, he had a collision with an oncoming vehicle and killed the oncoming driver as a result of it. He survived. We prosecuted him and accepted a plea of death by careless driving. And he was uh, his license was, uh, you know, lost forever. But that never brings back the life of that poor person who's lost their life because of someone else's actions. Now, we spoke to the family of that particular driver uh, of the older gentleman, and they said we'd had lots of conversations with dad about this and he just refused to do anything about it. So one of the things I'd always say is exactly like Rachel says, most and Nigel and Alexandra, most important thing is don't do nothing. Do something about it. Now, if they are refuse to take any advice, then you may need to take it further yourself. One, evidence what you've got about. Why have you got those concerns? What have you got that raises those concerns with that person? Is it medical or is it just you've seen a more like Nigel Alexander was saying about those extra scrapes and issues on their vehicle? Now, if you evidence that, that's a great thing. First thing is then to have that conversation as Nigel Alexandra had said about it with them now if they still refuse within that what my recommendation is to contact the dvla yourself you can do that yourself completely freely and you can do it anonymously as well or just contact them now there's a link on our website through there's a page called the um law and the dvla in there you'll see there's a, a link to the how to contact the dvla now you can do that by email and different ways and phone calls and things like that they're very busy i know but at least you're doing something so contact them express details don't just say i'm just concerned about dad you need to evidence it that works really well and therefore they will action it if they can see sufficient evidence to look at now also if you've got concerns maybe about different things to do with their driving maybe not medical something yeah please do notify the police because you are telling them raising a web because if that person then gets stopped by the police by something they've got that evidence and they always keep these reports online and it will make them action and maybe do something further in the future so it's always worthwhile trying to follow up that conversation now if you want to hear more all about that story that i told you about the 89 year old driving the wrong down 
long way down the dual carriageway. I did a, a video with the BBC exactly all about this. It's on our website under a page called videos and you'll scroll down. It's about a second video on there. Please have a look at it. And that actually is a really good video to also play to the actual driver themselves. So if they are being very complacent, I'm perfectly okay. Play that video to them, have that conversation said, dad, yeah. dad, mum, is that you? Yeah. Rob, there's a follow up on that question, which would actually be a very simple route. OK, uh, apparently they've not in, he's not he said this chap said he wouldn't have an eye test. Now, he's over 75. If he has to he has to say on his renewal form that he's had an eye test. If he hasn't had an eye test, you can report that anonymously to the DVLA. Yes. Yeah, so so actually the the requirement is, is that you must be able to read a number plate at 20 meters. That's the legal requirement when you come. You don't actually actually have to formally have an eyesight test. You just need to say that I can read a number plate at 20 meters. Now, what we would want to do is maybe next time you take them out, say it's about five, six car lengths. Can you read that number plate, dad or mum? Can you see that down the road? Now, if they can't, I would definitely 100 percent contact the police and say that I am concerned about their sight and driving, because then that produces enough sufficient evidence. We're currently running a national eyesight campaign, which I'm hosting up with a number of organizations across the whole of the country. And we're trying to encourage everybody to have regular eyesight tests with an optician, not just a 20 meter number plate one. Really want to encourage regular eyesight tests. So we've got a webinar later on this week with Valerie Singleton all about the importance of driving with good eyesight. So maybe, get them involved in looking at that web webinar with us as well. That could be a good way to do it as well. But please, mm -hmm. if you're concerned about their site, honestly contact the police because they will go around and knock on their door and you've given them the evidence to have a suspicion that they've got defective eyesight and they can get that person to read 20 meter number plate test. And if they can't, they can revoke their driving license there and then. OK, so really important thing that we could perhaps do in that particular thing. So got some other questions here as well. It says my 89 year old mother lives in a village in Cornwall. She can't walk more than 100 meters unaided as she's crippled with arthritis. <laughs> she is a she is a female Roger. They're saying she always says she always loved driving cars and has no local buses anywhere near. Obviously, unfortunately, in Cornwall, that can be a very common factor. Her car has just had expensive repairs to multiple scrapes. Last time um, they traveled down to see her, it is scraped just across the front and the back. She gets very riled if there's any suggestion of not driving anymore. Do you know if there's any similar assessment service near St. Austell in Cornwall? Now, I'm sure Rachel can answer that one for us. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Cornwall Mobility cover uh, the whole of the Devon and Cornwall area, and they do have both the assessment service, very comprehensive assessment service, and they do have a very competent hubs advice officer. So uh, get in touch with Cornwall Mobility. Um, you know, ideally, if she could go for an assessment with them, then that would be ideal. But at least maybe contact their hubs officer and find out what else is available. There might not be public transport, but there might be a community bus service that she could perhaps start using. So definitely uh, get in touch with Cornwall Mobility. Yeah. They, their contact details, if you go to the main, what well, you can Google Cornwall Mobility, it's bound to come up as the first search, or you will be able to find their details via the Driving Mobility main centre, but definitely there is help down there. And I think one of the really important things to bear in mind on this is obviously have that conversation with them again, as we just talked about, highlight about those particular things and say, look, you know, OK, if you're concerned, to, if you have, if you are riled about me asking these questions, prove to me that you're a good driver. Go and do one of these assessments. And do you know what? A lot of them will. And but there will be a time all of us have to retire from driving. That's going to happen to us all at some point in our lives. Now, the last thing we want to do is leave it till, unfortunately, it's too late, where unfortunately we may have caused an injury or death to someone else. And there are there are people who do that. There's a small minority, but there's a small minority who do that. There's also a small minority who give up early because they lose confidence. And therefore, normal driving assessments, not a mobility one, can often help build that confidence as well. So there's a whole range, and we've got some webinars, previous webinars we've done about assessments covering all that on our website as well. And you've also got a link on our page called Courses, which will take you to where local courses, even like the Cornwall Mobility Centre, where they are and the contact details, you can find through that page on our website as well. So we've got lots of useful things to do to help and support people. Now, Rachel, one thing I would just want to ask you is, have you had 
much inquiries when you've had people who've had to maybe be forced from stop driving have you found that the situations that actually when they've stopped they found new ways of getting away and actually things have changed in their lives to the better yeah, absolutely. I mean, sometimes it is a shock to some people, but um, other people, actually, it comes as a relief. They know, you know, not the Rogers, unfortunately, but maybe the Susans and the Peters. They sometimes feel they're driving on because there's pressure to do so by other people in the family. They might be the grandparent taxi service, for example. And when they are actually told to stop, some people do find it a relief for a start. But obviously, there are the Rogers who, you know, in disbelief and, and shock. But when they do start finding alternative methods, and in most cases, we can find them something that can help. And they do find actually the social aspect of getting on a bus or meeting the regulars on a community transport actually improve their social sphere. So when we're driving a car, we're very isolated. We're going from A to B just on our own where we want to go. And we don't talk to people. Whereas, you know, a lot of people do actually find that they, their, you know, as I say, friends and family sphere actually increases. So it's not always doom and gloom stopping driving, even though the first impact may feel that way. Yeah, and I have found this myself from dealing with many people over the many years now in the older driver community is actually people where they have actually planned, prepared exactly as Nigel Alexandra showed us today so well, is actually when it's happened and they've actually started, they've got used to it, they've prepared to it, and a lot of them have come back. And I've had people even who've had been forced to stop driving suddenly say, you know what, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. You know, my life is much more fulfilled. Just as Rachel said, you know, they felt very insular before, didn't realize how much they were. Now they've suddenly got lots of new friends, lots of new people, mm -hmm. and actually it's reinvigorated their lives again. Mm -hmm. So it's about selling it well to people about actually yep. this is a positive thing. It doesn't have to be negative. It is really a positive thing that we can all do. Mm -hmm. Now, and just another, to say, sorry, go on then. sorry, Rob, there's just one more thing I'd like to add to that. The other thing that the Hubs Mobility Service does, yeah, we're, we're focusing mostly on transport, but we're also tackling loneliness and isolation. So we can also give advice on what is available in their area in terms of lunch clubs, things they wouldn't necessarily have thought about doing until they get in touch with us and say, oh, I can't go out. I'm, yeah, I'm lonely. I'm isolated. And we say, have you thought about going down the road? There's, you know, you can meet like minded people. And we can also talk about better benefits advice um, we signpost to other places so that perhaps they're not aware that they can get attendance allowance which may actually help pay for a taxi now and then so you know we can help in other ways as well yeah. thanks Rob brilliant thank you now we've got another um, inquiry here so my husband was diagnosed first with a mild stroke as he fell down and bleeding so he's been to A&E and the doctor asked him to go and have a driving mobility test um, we did, and it appears that he may have failed it um, with a cogn cognition uh, result. But after a fall, a test, he had a uh, he had no mild stroke. He was just very depressed to stop. All of a sudden, he stopped driving. He has been driving for fifty seven years with any without any issues or an accident. Now he is driving. Perhaps he can easily drive now. If a doctor has made him, I says doctor has now made him very nervous um, since he's had a stroke. What should I do? Shall I jump in on this one? Yes, Rob? please. Um, yeah. yeah, again, just to confirm, we never ever fail a driving a driver just on their cognitive results. We will always allow them to go out in the car. We never stop an assessment just on cognitive results. 95% of the assessment is based on what we see in the car. So it, he won't have failed. Yes, he may have scored low on the cognitive scoring, but we never take a license or recommend a license is taken away because someone hasn't done well on the cognitive scoring. It will have been largely based on what was seen in the car may not have been our assess our center that assessed him it could have been anywhere in the country but all assessment centers do operate the same way we're all under the driving mobility standards um, and we do hear it sadly again and again this thing oh I've never had any points on my license never been done for speeding never had an accident however you have to take into consideration that we're not the same people as we were as we get older our driving does deteriorate for all of us you know we don't have the reaction times as we heard earlier that you know we previously had and what we're looking to do as assessment centers is intervene before a serious accident happens he might not have had an accident up until now there may potentially have been a lot of people 
you know, driving, avoiding him, taking avoiding action, we don't know, you know, I'm not saying that that is definitely the case. However, potentially other drivers have had to take action to avoid a collision because of this person's driving. And, you know, I don't wish to sound condescending. I, you know, that's, that's not my intention, but we will have seen something or the assessors on the assessment will have seen something why unfortunately we recommended that his license was, um, was revoked by the DVLA. Um, he could, if he feels and um, you know he wants to appeal, he can appeal to the DVLA. That should take place within six months of his license being taken away. Um, if his doctor or consultant feels that his what it wasn't a stroke um, and his condition, whatever it was, has improved. And if the doctor is prepared to speak to the DVLA on his behalf, if he wants to make an appeal um, and his medical condition has improved, he can apply for a provisional disability assessment license to come and be reassessed and see, you know, if indeed his driving has improved perhaps that medical condition has actually got better it does happen with strokes or the like where somebody can actually improve their condition so I would say you know if you seriously think he, he has got better from this stroke and his driving isn't now affected then appeal to the DVLA yeah fantastic stuff um, and also just one thing with driving mobility centres, I thought it'd be useful, Rachel, just to explain that mobility centres aren't just about assessment. You also an adaptions group as well, haven't you? So you can actually get someone along and actually often advise them about extra adaptions that may help them to carry yeah. on driving safely for longer. That's it. If we see someone who isn't fit to drive on the road, perhaps because they've got a limb weakness or, um, you know, as I say, they're not able to grip the steering wheel very well and uh, you know, turn that wheel safely when they're turning into a side turning, for example, or if perhaps their feet are a problem, perhaps they've got one sided weakness, they may even need to just swap from a manual car to an automatic, perhaps, or we could look at left foot accelerators. So if we see someone who has you know, the potential perhaps to continue driving, but we don't believe at the moment that a, a standard manual or automatic is the way forward then we can perhaps look at adaptations but it is obviously if we think that person has the capacity to learn to use them um, and there aren't fundamental you know, errors in their driving that are being impacted by their medical condition so we can help in some cases yes Rob thank you brilliant fantastic so there's lots of really positive information there I know we've just had the lady uh, the gentleman or lady who came back to us and asking about their their um, farm who they were concerned about lives away from them um, uh, and just talking about there about filling in the form about his license renewal now one of the things I'd say is actually when we're going through that form there are set questions that you need to answer can you read a number plate at 20 meters one of the best things I'd always say is right let's legitimately answer this question let's go to the an optician and get him to give you the answer correctly for you I think that's a really positive thing to do because then he's filling it in with confidence rather than just yeah I think I'm okay which a lot of people mm -hmm. do because a lot of people, I think there's some research showed that when they did ask lots of people of all different ages, what's 20 meter number plate test? Most people couldn't, hadn't even one heard about it, but two couldn't even recognize what 20 meters was. So actually, best thing is actually to go and have a, a proper test with a um, optician or optometrist. That's always the yeah. best way forwards. Could I just jump back on that one very quickly, Rob, as well? Um, we don't know in this case whether there's a medical condition involved as well. However, obviously, it could be uh, notifiable to the DVLA. So ensure that that is also notified if it's not already been done, because that could also form part of uh, whether DVLA sent him for an assessment. So make sure it's notified. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the important thing to mention about notifiable medical conditions as well. Now, ultimately, the law says it's down as us as drivers to notify the DVLA ourselves. That is our legal requirement. And unfortunately, GPs sometimes don't notify. They don't have a legal requirement to inform the DVLA. However, they're being much better these days. There's a lot more education as we've gone through on that presentation about them, the requirements and that duty of care to do. So sometimes they will. But again, like I said to you at the start, if you are concerned as a family member or, or even a friend, you can actually inform the DVLA. But again, evidence it. OK, so don't just leave it to them because it's better to do something than nothing at all. Um, because people, if they do fail to tell the DVLA that they've got a medical condition, they can be prosecuted. It's fines. It could be a disqualification, a law and points in their license anyway. So something they need to be away. It is an offence that they can. And as we get older, we know very much the more points we get on our license, our insurance can rock it as a result of it as well. Um, so we've got another question come in. It says, um, my dad is a Roger. 
He has lost confidence driving anywhere he hasn't been before and only makes one trip a week to my house and back, which is about 30 miles on the motorway. He drives in the middle lane only and has got lost three times recently when the roadworks near his house have diverted him to an unfamiliar route. We think he has early dementia based on this and other issues. So it has started to raise my concerns and the families. What should we do about it? She says, I will contact his GP, though. Mm. Yeah, that's brilliant. And and um, I'll just jump in again. I mean, it sounds as though yeah, th this particular person has received some good advice today and, and is acting. But just to say, um, yes, obviously, dementia is notifiable. So if he gets a diagnosis, then um, he, you know, that is notifiable. But the other thing that is notifiable is memory problems if those impact on driving. So even if he doesn't get a dementia diagnosis, if it is felt that his memory is impacting driving, which it clearly is in this case, that is also notifiable. So make sure that that goes into the DVLA. And again, they might well launch an investigation. Brilliant. Fantastic. And we mentioned in the presentation today about those calculations, about how difficult it is to know that, you know, often things are much more expensive and actually it's cheaper sometimes to retire from driving. Now, if you want to know, we have on our website under the advice tab, there's a thing called the cost calculator. We use a sort of link through um, ROSPA, who run a, a website with us, all about giving advice on that. So maybe direct that and go through that cost calculator. That might be a useful thing as well to utilize on yourselves. So just going to say, is there any further from Nigel, Alexandra or Rachel that you wanted to add to today? Um, Rod, I just really echo what you said. Take action. We lost our mother because we as a family did not take sufficient action. This happens. This is the reality. So the big message is here. Start those family conversations and get them started now. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel and Alexandra, and thank you, Rachel, uh, for your wonderful presentations today. Very thought-provoking, really informative, and we very much appreciate your help and support today. So just to let you know, at the end of this webinar, we'll end it, you'll basically be directed to a survey about the webinar. Really useful for us to get your feedback because we try to run regular ones of these, and we want to know how we're doing with that. So please do. If you want to answer or tell us any more uh, outside the survey, then just click on the link to our website, which has an email address, and you can contact us as well through that. So please make sure you do that. Um, have an explore of our website. Like I said, there's lots on there. In the next year or so, we're working very much now at redesigning our website to be much more user-friendly. So you will see some changes going on on there as well. And we really want to help you and support. And if you've got any ideas of webinars that you want for other things in the future, then have a look at them. Please let us know, because we're really keen to help and support mature motorists to carry on driving safely for longer and recognize there will be a time that we all need to retire from driving. So thank you, everybody, for today. I really appreciate our presenters, and I hope the rest of your day goes well. Thank you very much, everybody. Goodbye.